It's Friday the 5th of February, my name's Juan Brown, you're watching the Blanco Lirio channel and today we're going to have our own little safety stand down. There are simply too many similarities between the two recent UH-60 Blackhawk crashes from the New York Guard Unit and the Idaho Guard Unit to not have a wider stand down than simply the unit affected by the crash. What are the similarities? We've got a routine training mission going off at night in marginal weather, potential IMC conditions, potential or known icing conditions, snow on the ground, using night vision goggles. In the case of Boise, they were using also nape of the earth, low level training, that means 200 feet and below. Both flights had a senior evaluator pilot on board the aircraft, and both flights used th a crew consisting of three pilots. Normally on a UH-60 Black Hawk helicopter, your crew consists of two pilots and one crew chief, enlisted crew chief. Both flights resulted in what appears to be a high-speed impact. We now know that these UH-60 aircraft were equipped with known icing capability, both de-ice and anti-icing anti capability, and that anti and those icing systems were operational. However, there's one form of icing that still needs to be discussed in a safety stand down. What do you do in the event when the windshield ices up so much that when you hit the de-ice, or de-ice or anti-ice, I'm not sure which one it is on the windshield of the UH-60, but when you melt the ice off of the windshield of a UH-60, much like an old MD-80 airliner, where is that ice going to go? It's going to shed back into the engines. The engines are also anti-ice, but you can get such big chunks of ice into those engines to cause some real problems. What do you do to mitigate that? The use of night vision goggles. Night vision goggles has some pretty serious limitations. They are a great tool. When I was uh, flying C-130s in the Nevada Air National Guard, I never got qualified in the use of night vision goggles. We did all of our low levels and or night formation flying and or night low levels under visual conditions. When you're departing a place like Boise at night that's got a lot of ambient city light around it, especially this time of year when there's snow on the ground, there's a lot of reflectivity for the NVGs to pick up on. As you head further and further out into the back country, that ambient lighting from the city goes away. The clouds block any starlight or any other additional ambient lighting that may assist you and moonlight. And eventually things get pretty dark. And if the weather moves in suddenly, things can go from dimly lit to like closing a door on a closet, just black. What do you do in those situations? You got to do your emergency escape. What's your emergency escape plan? What's your emergency escape training like? You've got to turn the helicopter to a heading that's going to get you away from the highest terrain and fly away from that terrain. Remember in helicopters you can't you can't just stop hover and land in IMC conditions. You have had to made that decision before you lost all visibility. The only way you can hover an aircraft, uh, one of these helicopters effectively, is with visual reference to the ground or through your night vision goggles. Once things go black, you gotta fly away like, a, like an aircraft. You've gotta quickly transition to instruments and do an instrument escape away from the high terrain. And if there is a mountain between you and your escape point, the chances are you may impact it. The same goes for doing a vertical climb out of the terrain. That's not really feasible in these helicopters. In order to especially hand fly on instruments a helicopter, you've got to have forward motion. Before any military flight can depart, that crew must fill out a risk assessment form and hand that form into those in charge of flying that day. Depending on the level of risk that they come up with as they fill out this form depends on which level of command approves this flight before it takes off. The riskier the flight, the higher up the command chain, this flight has to be approved. Are we correctly assessing these risk assessments? Or have these become so mundane, such a part of daily operation, we're treating the risk assessment as simply eyewash and not really paying attention to the results that the risk assessment is telling you. Both of these accidents involved the use of a senior 
evaluator pilot on board the aircraft. Now, there's a, an old saying in aviation that one of the most dangerous flights in aviation is when two instructors get on board. When you have two very experienced crew members on board the aircraft, that can lead to problems. And that's pretty widely known in aviation, and there's plenty of examples of it. What I would like to see is how does the risk assessment take that into account? The way I see the risk assessment, it does not take that into account. Generally, on the risk assessment, the more experience all the crew members have, the lower the risk. But at some point, there's got to be a, a consideration for the fact that when you get too much experience on the aircraft, perhaps your risk actually goes up a notch. The substitution of crew chiefs for pilots. Why are we removing the crew chief from the training flight and putting a pilot in there? Is this simply a matter to be more efficient and to save flying training hours or get guys done quickly? Back up here a little bit. When you're flying in the guard, it's a full-time job, even if you're a part-timer. When you are a guard pilot, you have all the same currency requirements as anybody in the active duty. That means you your part-time guard job is effectively a full-time job. As such, it's hard to coordinate everybody's schedule to get them in in time to get, keep all their requirements up to date with, the, the, with their civilian lives, and it puts pressure on everybody to get this done in a timely fashion to maintain unit readiness. In my Air Force days flying the C-141 and the C-130, we always had enlisted crew members. And the advantage of having enlisted crew members on board is they can speak bluntly and directly to the officer pilots when they see something that the pilots don't. The enlisted crew members are not necessarily in the same career path or even direct chain of command as are the officer pilots. And they can and will diplomatically and bluntly point out anything that they see that you don't. A critical part of the crew chief's position on the Black Hawk helicopter is to be a part of the flight team, help clear the flight team in areas of tight terrain, low visibility, especially when it comes to landing, looking out the side of the aircraft and making sure everything is clear. So in summary, I'd like to see an evaluation of our risk assessment program. Should we add a category on there that includes flying with senior evaluators on board the aircraft? Shall we somehow quantify the fact that flying with two very senior pilots on board the aircraft can actually increase risk instead of decrease risk? Are we current and proficient in all of our icing knowledge, systems knowledge, limitations and procedures? Are we current and qualified in all of our emergency escape procedures? How do we train for those emergency escape procedures? How do we do those emergency escape procedures? And again, review the limitations of night vision goggles. And above all else, are we exercising the proper level of management and oversight of these risky training flights? Thanks. See you here.